and welcome to Global Ideas. This is an initiative by Hong Kong Baptist University to bring some of the finest minds together to help us understand some of the complex challenges of our times. Now, this is Global Ideas season two. In season one, we explored what is called the new Cold War or Cold War 2.0. And in that, our focus had been this wider contest between the USA and China. In this season, we are exploring what is called the deglobalization of global media. And we want to understand whether there is a, this deglobalization actually happening. Or as someone said, that deglobalization is the ultimate fake story because we are living in a hyper-connected world where trade and tech ties are increasingly growing. Remember, we are also coming to you at a time when some of the most powerful economies in the world are reeling under the impact of a global pandemic. There is a war going on in Europe, and there is also a growing emphasis in the developing world over localization of internet, localization of media, localization of narratives. And of course, politics is also dominated by hyper-nationalist narratives. So how do we make sense of all of this? To make us understand, we are extremely delighted to be joined by an eminent personality all the way from London. We have with us Professor Susanna Franks. Professor Susanna Franks is a former BBC TV news and current affairs journalist who worked on flagship programs such as Panorama and Newsnight. She has been the Director of Research at the Center for Journalism in the University of Kent. And in 2012, she took, she took up a professorship at City University of London. She has also served as the head of the City University uh, Journalism Department, which is the oldest and the largest in the UK. She continues to teach and research there and has also held visiting positions at the Reuters Institute in Oxford and the Journalism School in Berkeley. Professor Franks is globally known for her expertise in media and development, women and the media, the coverage of humanitarian disasters, the relationship between media and aid, political communication, and most crucially for the discussion today, the history of the BBC. Professor Franks, welcome to Global Ideas. It's a pleasure to have you here. Very nice to be here, thank you. We also have with us Professor Daya Thusu. Professor Thusu is a renowned global scholar of international communication. He is widely known for his extensive publications in the field of communication. He is the founder and managing editor of the Sage Journal, Global Media and Communications. He has authored or edited 20 books. We are still waiting for the 21st, Professor Thusu. <laughs> professor Thusu has uh, been a distinguished visiting professor and inaugural Disney chair at Swarzman College, Tsinghua University in Beijing and currently teaches at Hong Kong Baptist University. Professor Tusu, welcome to Global Ideas. Thank you. And we also have Mr. Vincent Wong with us. Mr. Wong is a former bureaucrat, currently doing his PhD at HKBU. He has 25 years of industry experience and is a pioneer in promoting solution journalism in Asia. He, is, he has an MBA and LLB from the University of Cambridge and Imperial College in London. As usual, Vincent, a pleasure to have you with us. Hi. Welcome. Good All to right. be here. Thank you, Anilash. All right, so we go to our guest in London. We have Professor Susanna Franks. Let me start by asking Professor Franks. I was looking at so many definitions of, because there are so many definitions of deglobalization. And one of them which really struck me was that, was by a professor uh, from Vienna School of International Studies who says deglobalization is a movement towards a less connected world. And I, I was wondering whether this is really a concerted, a coordinated movement. So first of all, do you think this is a movement? And the other part of the question is, is deglobalization happening at all? And then in terms of media and communication, is there an emphasis on localization of media? Is there an emphasis on deglobalization of global media? Over to you, Professor Franks. Well, firstly, thank you very much um, for inviting me. And I'm delighted to be with you here today to, to discuss this really, really important phenomenon. Um, so the, the way I would frame it is that, um, you know, we still live in a very globalized world and uh, every day we see this sort of hyper connectivity in, in, in so many ways. I mean, the, you know, the very fact of this, the nature of the, the program that you're, you're putting on today is, is, is just, a, you know, just an effect of that. But at the same time, we live in an increasingly fragmented media environment. I think that that that's the issue that the the, the possibilities are now that you can sort of customize fragments um, and lead to this what 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 is often called localization. That you're able to listen to a very very narrow narrative, be it of your own identity group, um, your own sort of regional interests, or or or, or whatever. And I think that that's the issue that we're there's there's fewer and fewer opportunities, particularly in the news environment, for shared spaces, shared public spaces, shared understanding of, of facts. 
Um, so I think that that that's that's really what's going on. I don't think there's a concerted movement of of uh, localizing, but I think that there's more and more potential and opportunity of, for fragmentation. Um, and then you get you know multiple multiple splinters listening to their own groups and enjoying their own media, which which is great in some ways, but it also means that there's there's much less of a sort of shared public understanding of news, and that of course is what the uh, um, you know, the, the BBC has has really given us over the over this past hundred years. All right, we will come to the BBC part. Vincent, go ahead. Yeah. I think can I ask a follow-up questions on this one? Sure, As a on. media person, um I'm always skeptical about this buzzwords like deglobalization. Because as a matter of fact, like even when two hostile countries are arguing or uh, there's a trade war, we actually see the movements of people, capital, or even goods still continue in, in some cases even grow. So what's your view on that? Is it just a political slogan or is it try to sway voters? Why does this word even exist in the first place? And why does it uh, become more popular over the past few years or even in the future? Well, no, I mean, I agree with you to some extent. I think using, using these buzzwords is sometimes not, not terribly helpful because, you know, there's so many um, contradictory things all going on at the same time. And, and, uh, and it's, it's a bit um, sloppy to just think you can sort of capture it all in, in that sort of way. But I do think, um, and, and I agree with you that we, you know, that we still, you know, the, the, the sort of movements of capital and ideas and 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 connectivity is 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 still you know very much sort of motoring on. But I, but I'm going back to, to to what I was saying before. I think that the the point is that there's this very very much this emphasis towards fragmenting of of media. The the fact that we you know media is now on demand. There's not a kind of shared schedule and a shared understanding and a shared international. Um, Broad, you know, broadcaster that's taken or, or uh, media platforms that are the, that are taken as as um, you know the, the gospel and that, that we all agree on. And I think that that's the issue. And I think that's what the, this is trying to capture. This this word it's, it's trying to capture the the sort of fragmenting of media and the fragmenting of of communities uh, all wanting their own their own narratives and to a certain extent using another buzzword their their own sort of echo chambers, which is a worrying worrying phenomenon. So in other words, more difficult to come up with a consensus among different countries and, and nations. Okay. Well, a consensus, you know, even within societies, you know, I mean, look at the United States, um, the, you know, the, the, the degree of polarization and polarization expressed through the media and as a result of the, the sort of media consumption is quite frightening that communities only listen to their own media. Um, they aren't interested interested in any kind of shared shared space or shared shared understanding, and th and that's that's extremely bad for for democratic uh, you know democratic understanding and democratic values. True. Now we'd like to bring Professor Tusu in here at this point in time. Professor Tusu, would you like to? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I had to use these because there's some construction work going upstairs or downstairs, <laughs> so uh, I didn't want to you know have that noise. Um, before I go to talk about BBC, because uh, BBC is the um, quintessentially global media organization. If you talk about deglobalization of media, we need to think about what is BBC doing about it and, you know. But before that, I wanted to say a few things about this idea of globalization itself. Um, you know, it, although in general academic or policy discourse or journalistic discourse. It is a phenomena associated with end of the Cold War, opening up of markets, the frictionless capitalism, as you know, Bill Gates called it. Um, but this is a much older story. You know, we are, uh, famously, um, a book was published some decades ago now, maybe the 90s or was it late 90s? I can't remember, 98, I think it was. Uh, which talked about telegraph as the Victorian internet, right? Mm. Um, by an economist, a journal, a journalist who works for the Economist. So um, you know, it's not not new. Global trade, technical uh, exchanges, uh, power uh, contestations—nothing new. I think one aspect which we perhaps take should take into account when we look at deglobalization 
is also the phases of globalization. So if we think of 1990s, everything is opening up, new territories are being incorporated into new liberal capitalism. And then 2008 happens. And suddenly people are rethinking about, you know, can we depend so much on vagaries of US, um, you know, home uh, insurance, for example. And it is no coincidence that uh, institutions like BRICS emerged at that time, right? Mm. And then now in 2020 onwards, you have this COVID and you have a, a very different reconfiguration of powers, de you know, decoupling, whatever you want to call it. And that has then given this um, impetus to the idea that globalization as we understood it, for last three decades has come to end and something else is happening. Right? So I think that's very really important to contextualize it in, you know, it's not just uh, a buzzword. Of course, you know, it's been used for, you know, for in journalistic writing and some academic writing too, but you know, there is a kind of argument about why we are talking about globalization now. Uh, that's just by way of preface. But the question I wanted to ask Susanna, and it's so nice to see you, uh, we were supposed to be in a panel together in Akriya, but unfortunately I couldn't make it. Um, among your extensive amount of work and professional work that you have done, BBC, of course, is arguably most important, you know, because you was there and also you've written about um, various aspects of global media. You also worked in various uh, different, you would, probably, you would, is it right? You were in India also at some point for the BBC? Yes, yes, yes. I was, I was in yeah. India for a while. Yeah. And you've worked mm -hmm. on Africa also. Yeah, um, yeah. So when we talk about global media, you know, there isn't a better example than the BBC. Um, you know, it's been global almost from its inception. You know, Empire Service was established way back in the mm. 1930s. Um, but there's also a certain criticism that goes with that, both domestically in terms of, you know, um, the Tories don't like the BBC for its liberal bias. Um, the left people do not like the BBC. They think it's too traditional, too elitist, right? Um, and internationally also, it is often seen as a, um, and I had a phrase in the book I wrote many times, many years ago, I called it, you know, propaganda in gentlemanly tones. You know, why is it different from American media? It's more subtle mm -hmm. and more sophisticated, but actually essentially doing the same thing. So how do you react to that kind of a criticism that the BBC has, uh, you know, one could argue that, you know, if, if this is being criticized by the left and the right, it must be doing something right, because both sides dislike it. Um, and it's also the case that in terms of its global presence and influence, it remains even in this time of uh, extremely crowded media ecology, uh, probably the most credible international uh, news organization certainly in most credible broadcasting. So how do you, how do you react to the, um, to the criticism, uh, more in the, in the global context? Of course, you can refer to the domestic aspect too. Uh, I think it's particularly significant because we are celebrating the 100 years of BBC's founding, founding and, you know, it, and it has created precedents for other broadcasters, public broadcasters around the world. Well, and I think you're, you're obviously, you're obviously right that uh, the BBC uh, is certainly not perfect and it has also received some fair criticism and some unfair criticism over these past hundred years. I mean, firstly, I'll talk about in a domestic context. Uh, I mean, having a, a public broadcaster, which is complete, which is really different from people don't understand this, it's different from a state broadcaster, means that we all feel we're part of it. We all feel we own it and that it, it has to, um, serve all all of the public, uh, and that also makes for a very intense intense relationship. And that there is, you know, day every day there's sort of criticism about uh, whether the BBC is, is serving communities properly, whether it's reflecting too much of the left or the right, or, or as you said, um, I and mean, just 
uh, an hour ago, I was listening to an item, for example, about regional accents in the BBC News and that the BBC doesn't properly reflect our regional accents and it's too snobbish and just wants the you know received pronunciation. So, so it, we, it, it is very much at the sort of heart of uh, of this the 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 public sphere in in here in the UK where where we we all you know pay for it uh, through through license fees. So I think that that's. It, it's almost that it's it's you know we call it auntie because it is almost part of the family and that's 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 the relationship that that the public often feels with it. But looking, you know, much broader and looking internationally, I think that that's that's much more um, complicated and that has changed a lot over the years. I mean, you're right. The the BBC was set up um, in the 1930s as the Empire Service, uh, and if we listen to now or you read some of the scripts from that time, you know, it's pretty shocking the way that um, it's it's sort of um attitudes and the, the way it, it comes over as this sort of um colo you know very very staid colonial broadcaster sort of broadcasting to the to its um dominion dominions uh, overseas but i i do think that you know as as there's more and more noise you know which you referred to and and competition and lots and lots and lots now of international broadcasters there's there's not just the bbc world service which there was for for many years and 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 you know various uh, sort of rather le less less well funded and and less respected american channels and and, and so on I do think that the, the values that the BBC has has tried to stand for and has tried to sort of craft over these years have, have become, you know, more and more significant and, and you know, by, by many communities valued more and more the idea that this is a public broadcaster, it's not the state, it's not the, the, um, the British state views, and, and there's often big, big fights, as you well know, between the, the, the state and, and, uh, and the BBC, uh, and that it is telling people what they don't necessarily want want to hear you know but it but it is telling the truth and it and it has you know on any measure of trust now it it is the most trusted uh, uh disseminator of of news and i think that that's that's the key thing isn't it you know how how trusted are you by audiences and the bbc is still very very trusted um you know this the there's you know many arguments saying that, that that it is it is still you know a form of propaganda but i think in comparison to anything else um to the hundreds and hundreds of international news channels that there are now um it still does you know bring something special and a value which is which is this notion notion of being being trusted by audiences to tell the truth um one of the thank you for that one of the uh, areas where international in the television news media, which remains still very influential, I would argue. Uh, it may be consumed in a different way. People might be looking at it in, in, on the mobile phones, but they're watching a Reuters you know, television story, or they're watching CNN or BBC or RT or whatever it is. But visuals are very important. And they gain extra importance at the time of a crisis, uh, a conflict situation, for instance. Um, and again, BBC has a very long history of covering wars and conflict. And, and as you know, during even during the uh, you know, Second World War, um, the German establishment was listening to BBC broadcasters, uh, radio, to 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 compare what was actually happening on on the on the on the battlefield, rather than depending on their own propaganda machinery, which was again very sophisticated. I mean, their uh, propaganda machinery and very well resourced. So. Um, if we look at what's happening in uh, Ukraine today, or actually since, since February 2022, some might say even 2014, um, how do you see the coverage of the BBC? Because when you are, where I'm, I'm located now in Hong Kong, I'm looking at it from a, a slightly different perspective. And well, I would have done that in London anyway, but that's irrelevant. <laughs> but I'm saying there's a different position in the sense that, um, you know, there is another narrative of what's happening in Ukraine, which uh, you don't see that often highlighted in the mainstream coverage of the BBC. Um, and not just the BBC, generally Western, dominant Western mainstream media. Do you see that uh, as an issue uh, that there is a kind of the tone and the tenor and the emphasis 
Uh, and it becomes particularly striking when you contrast that with what has been happening in Ethiopia at around the same time, where many more people have died. Uh, I mean, we're talking about you know half a million people. Um, so, and the coverage is, uh, I mean, I don't want to emphasize that point. You know, it's not everyday news item. So how do you explain that in the sense also um, that, you know, it is a European war, essentially, and a large part of the world is actually taking a more nuanced, a more neutral position, as we have seen in the way um, governments have responded to uh, UN for you know, resolutions on, on Ukraine, for example. Um, so do you see that well, there's perhaps a, an issue here that uh, BBC is following is certain agenda, which may be, uh, as I said before, you know, presented in a very gentlemanly way, but essentially it's not uh, very different from what a, a, a US-led network would be representing. Well, there's a lot to, uh, a lot to cover there. Um, very interesting um, questions. May I go back first of all to that? I'd, I'd quite like to sort of touch on what you started with, uh, the talking about the Second World War and, and as a sort of context. The reason that the BBC um, took a particular line in the Second World War is that if you look back, I know there wasn't a BBC during the First World War, but there was a media coverage in the newspapers. Yeah. And there was huge criticism at the end of the First World War that the public hadn't been told the truth. If you look at the media reporting of the First World War, it's all kind of gung-ho, we're all doing wonderfully, and sort of let's jolly on the troops and, and, and uh, you know, and win, win these battles. And that became a very, very, um, contested after the war, and that was seen that the media had done a had done a shocking job. And it was quite interesting that if you if you're looking at the First World War now, um, it's much more that we turn to the poetry and the literature of the First World War to actually tell the truth Absolutely. about what was going going on. And there were some, you know, still today, we we um, all the time are, are you you um, you hear reference to this this remarkable literature of the First World War because the media was doing which which I I believe partly flowered because the media was doing such a terrible job. So if you come to the Second World War, um, the start of the Second World War, the BBC reporting was not. I mean, I'm looking at the, the first period in the end of 1939. The reporting was not um, particularly particularly good. Um, they weren't really telling the full story. They weren't. It was a pretty pretty sort of, um, you know, uh, limited narrative. And then something changed um, in 1940 when things got worse and worse as they did. And, you know, Britain was was on the on the brink of being being invaded. And it, it looked as if things were, you know, it, it, this was all going to end a, end a terrible, terrible disaster. The BBC changed it, changed its position and decided that actually telling people the truth about what was going on, dreadful as it was, was actually doing a much greater service and was leading, would, would lead to greater trust and great, greater sort of, um, you know, community um, understanding, I, I suppose, and, and possibly, and paradoxically, knowing the bad news was actually better, better for morale. And there's, um, there's, a, there's a quite a good phrase, which is, um, uh, telling the truth became more important than consolation at that, at that period, that just consoling the audiences and telling them it was all going to be fine um, actually wasn't wasn't doing doing any kind of service, but telling them the truth. And this this is what what the reporting of the Second World War was. It was a lot. There was a lot of bad news. Well, particularly in 1940, there was a lot of bad news, you know, as as Dunkirk fell and the, the British retreated back across the channel in little boats. The BBC started to tell the truth and then began to realize that actually audiences really respect that. They really trust that. And that is why across Europe, and it's not just the German high command, but people were listening to the BBC, a lot of them, um, you know, and in huge danger. I mean, you know, it was a, there was a death penalty for owning a radio set and listening to the BBC across Europe at that point. But it was so trusted because it told the truth um, that people were willing, willing to risk, risk their lives. So, um, and I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm, what I'm just, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, developing this trust again and on audience trust in times of crisis is seen as a, as a, 
became a, a more and more important value. But turning to the to the present um, the present day, um, I first of all want to address the point which I, I die which you raised about you know which crises do we report? And as as you probably know, I've written a lot about this. Um, you know, going right back to the that's, that's to the why 1990s. I'm asking you this because yeah, I know you're thinking yeah. about it. Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, it's it is still uh, extraordinary. To, to me that kind of if you if you sit there as if you if you arrived from Mars and, and looked at what was happening on our planet now and you know where what is the most dead deadly wars where people are you know suffering the most uh, you wouldn't use the news values necessarily that, that we see again and again uh, and there are lots and lots of reasons for that and you, you know all the kind of um the whole literature about news values and why we report certain things and we ignore ignore other other things, which is uh, you know I and and others have written about um, you know in, in in many in many areas. So yes, I I, I mean I do personally find it um, you know very very troubling that we have a, a you know this this terrible um, situation in uh, you know in in um, Tigray and and Ethiopia and that isn't being given the kind of coverage that that it should. Um, so I I want to say yeah there because you you report the wars that are closer to home you report the wars that your your country is involved in and that your you know because Britain is pretty involved in uh, in Ukraine we have we're training Ukrainian soldiers here we're we're sending arms and we we have lots and many many Ukrainian refugees in in the UK so. So there is there is an element of pro what 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 um, Gulf and Rouge and so on and many others call proximity. Um, so that I I I think I think you're right that um, that 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 there is always this this need for balance for understanding um, what else is what else is going on. But actually, paradoxically, when we had the ridiculous um, shenanigans that we've had in our own domestic politics over the last last few weeks it became hard to even find news of, of Ukraine I and mean, I was I was sort of hunting around <laughs> to find out what was going on in Ukraine um mm -hmm. and in Iran as as well you know yeah. as as the the new the airways were just completely um crowded with whoever was our new prime minister and and who'd who'd um you know and how long which he or chance she of... stay right how yes, long you exactly stay? yeah yeah so so actually that um because I I do remember sort of you know, because the, the, some of these, um, there were some big um, developments in in September, in in late September, in um, in Ukraine. But I suppose also the Queen died as well. Um, yes. So there is always a worry about yeah. about news values and, what, and what, yeah. what's being reported. But you're absolutely right that uh, this is the first, the biggest European war since since 1945, and it has it has been. Um, Something that has consumed uh, our, our our attention in terms of international international news, and that that is not always a good thing. But I would say that when you talk about the actual narrative of the war, um, I suppose what you're saying is that uh, you know there is a kind of um, a more neutral and possibly even pro-Putin um, angle to this, and the the num if you look at the sheer numbers of countries represented in the United Nations votes, you're right that that uh, um, there wasn't a, an overwhelming majority for for condemning condemning Putin. But I think there are a lot of reasons for that as well, aren't there? There, there are a lot of uh, countries that don't necessarily want. To, I mean, in Africa, for example, is, which I know about more, a lot of countries that don't want to upset upset Russia. So I think you know you've got to tell tell that that story as well. Um, and in defense of the the reporting I, I i mean the one thing that strikes me particularly is that i think the, the bbc does an extremely good job of reporting from russia i mean they have a very very good russia editor steve rosenberg and if you follow what he does um you do understand a lot about what's going on in, in inside russia and what the 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 pressures are there and what what's happening to, to people and communities in in russia so that that i think gives you Gives you another another dimension, which I don't see in some of the and I don't think the American media do anything like that in in terms of really understanding what's going on on inside Russia. Um, and yes, yeah, I think that there is obviously, you know, there's a bias towards, um, you know, there there is sort of great hostility towards towards the Russia towards Russia and and Putin. But but I I don't know. I mean, I I don't really feel that that's 
the sort of I, I do feel one hears the other side. One hears the kind of anti-NATO narrative um, in in a way that um, makes you understand what um, what's going, you know, what what's going on in in, in other parts of the world and, and looking at, at Ukraine. Um, but uh, but I do think that the the sort of also the kind of um, the range of coverage and that, that we get huge amount of um, coverage from individuals inside um, local local reporting in inside Ukraine. I do think that again gives us gives us some kind of insights which which you probably don't get from a from a more sort of polished and also a more kind of what I, I do. I always feel the sort of American coverage of the of these sorts of situations is is so much more of this kind of fireman reporting you know just you know zooming in um telling the story and then zooming off to the to the next crisis i do think that the because the bbc has the um has had all the language services over the decades they have people who've been, been based in ukraine for many many years who who broadcast you know in to, to the language the 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 world service and the language services and there i think you get a sort of nuance and an expertise uh that, that that you don't get from a broadcaster that's just sort of you know although it's very well well resourced is just sort of flying in um telling a story and then and and flying out again right. so but back to the deglobalization because you know we're not we are definitely not here to put bbc into the dock and certainly not you or the spokesperson for the bbc so it should not sound like no, that. No. <laughs> i remember all the documentaries of john sweeney i used to follow him a lot and once he was how nearly arrested in russia and that's how we got to know how the inner machinery works. But moving on from uh, BBC to the globalization topic, which is the main theme of the discussion, Vincent, go ahead. Yes, I, I think it's quite interesting you compare the present time with World War I. And, and I think back then, um, global organization are much weaker compared to what happens after World War II. And I think the globalization has often been attributed to how strong or how important are the international institute? Can the same thing apply today in the media industry? Are the global media, particularly the Western ones, are in decline? Are more people trusting them or the way of doing news are simply different? That's why the whole global media industry has lost their charm or, or lost their influence. Well, I think that that that's that's the problem, isn't it? That when you talk about global media, you're talking about all sorts of other kind of what what Dyer was refers to as sort of infotainment. I mean, the the global media um, don't make their money out of news; they make their money out of lots, you know, lots of other um, uh, content. And and I think news has to struggle again and again because news is expensive. It's very expensive to do news well. Uh, and the global media platforms just prefer to hoover up what everybody else is doing, aggregate it and 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 put it out rather than actually having boots on the ground, going out and finding out what what what's what's going on. So I think that uh, the the position of news within global media, trusted, um, expensive, reliable news is is fragile and and, and I think that that's more and more worrying because I think we we have a generation coming now. Um, I'm not talking about the, the students that you teach or I teach who probably have a more sophisticated understanding of this, but but we have a rising generation who don't understand that you pay for news, that news is is, is something something expensive. Um, and I think that's very worrying because because you then have an elite that that is willing to pay for news and understand the value of high quality information, and you have um, the vast mass of a population that that just see news as you know a sort of extension of entertainment and it's something that's just sort of served up in a sort of aggregated form yes. for free but, okay so uh, taking further from vincent left uh, not just the not just the infotainment angle but going to the pure news itself do you think that so for example take, take, we can take the example of the coverage of pandemic so the crisis say in the us covered by the us media or the crisis say in the china covered by us media the crisis in India covered by US media is completely different. So going back to the question, do you think that the once upon a time really reliable, uh, these giants like the BBC and CNN, which used to have a lot of weightage around the world, do you think that partly also the reason the way we see, saw the coverage of the, of the pandemic, that they are, uh, they, they are on a decline uh, in, in some ways? Do you think that people are increasingly going towards their own media rather than 
looking at how the US media was talking about uh, what the governments were doing in their own countries. So for example, a US government will say that, okay, the Indian government is completely inefficient, or the Chinese are uh, completely inefficient in handling the pandemic, whereas there was dead, body, dead bodies piling up in New York. So do you think that, do you get a sense that, okay, the, the rise of the regional media in some of the most uh, important economics, albeit developing, is somewhere challenging the narratives uh, that have been there for so long, created by the Western world? Do you think that's happening at all? Or do you think it's like overestimation? Well, I mean, the, it depends. It depends where where you look. I mean, this is that's a huge, you know, this is a huge, huge debate. I mean, if we go right back to when Al Jazeera started, I think Al Jazeera did um, bring a sort of fresh perspective and show that that there was a, a different a different narrative for telling international news, uh, and that that's I'm not so convinced they're doing such a great job today. But I think that 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 really was something very very new new on the scene to show that that uh, this sort of this kind of dominant western particularly american american narrative was wasn't necessarily the best way i mean the, the 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 problem i always find is that when i when you sit in america and watch their news it is so parochial and so ill informed generally about the rest of the world that uh, you know it's it, it's quite it's quite extraordinary i mean there's so little interest really in 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 what's going on outside and, and a lot of the reporting you're right is is pretty cliched and, and pretty pretty limited um so that the the regional media has got a, a great space space to fill to tell to tell a better and a more nuanced and a, and a more angled view version but the you know i mean we could go on to this but i think uh, some of the local media also has its own issues you know i mean the news i mean diana knows much more about this but the there's a, the quality of news reporting in in india is is suffering at the moment and has sort of you know date there's sort of dangerous dangerous things going on on there um and likewise i'm, I'm not sure that i would turn to the chinese chinese media to to give me a, a a full and um comprehensive view of, of what what was going on during during the pandemic would that leads to a deglobalization or the americanization of the internet because we used to think the internet is one space, like one public forum. Family. Like, but there are like there are discussion or even books about even in the Western world, the internet is going to break into three parts. European is doing their own thing. American is doing more financial and stuff. And startup are coming, but why don't we come up with an entirely new platform? Why why don't we just scrap the old one and? and go to the new utopia right and and then we always have the saying that we have the internet and then we have the chinese internet right so at least we we are seeing four internets or even more so is that the deglobalization of the internet yes i i suppose in some senses it is it's a kind of fragmentation of the internet um and so and it's being sort of partly framed through through sort of political a sort of political wishes in, or, in order to sort of craft something that that works in a in an individual space. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think this sort of global the global vision um, is 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 now become rather, you know, rather contorted from you know compared to the the way it was envisaged envisaged originally. Absolutely, and also the way that the individual um, uh, regimes will then you know use it for their own benefit. I mean, if you look in in, in Iran. Um, this sort of switching off, or, and this happens in other repressive areas. We're switching off over the internet, and uh, you know, deliberately um, targeting the, the 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 protest movements and so on is 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 also a, a, a symptom of that as well. Right. Professor Tusu, how do you see this? This deglobalization through the rise of many internets in the world. Um, yes, I mean, it's a, as, as Susanna said, it is a, it's an indication of what is happening to the cyberspace. I mean. Uh, the, the phrase earlier used to describe this phenomena was balkanization of the internet. Um, but now that balkanization is happening uh, within nations, uh, you know, within blocks. I mean, Vincent mentioned the Chinese internet, um, which is actually the largest internet in the world with its own platforms. Um, so the argument is often made is that, that in, especially in the West, that the Chinese system is, you know, totally controlled by the uh, party state, which is a factual statement. 
But uh, some people have argued precisely because it was state controlled, they were able to develop their own platforms, which no other country with possible exception of Russia and Russians are not. So, sorry, I missed that. I missed that, Dyer. Yeah, to, to I developed able, their own one. Their own platforms. So they have Sorry, yeah. their own version of Twitter, their own version of Google, their own mm -hmm. version of Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. And given that the market is so massive, you know, it, it has survived and there's support from the state. Um, and also it has now been exported outside China, especially in developing countries. So that's an interesting kind of contestation between the open versus closed internet. Right. And then within the open internet too, we, we have obviously had a lot of work, academic work, most uh, you know, notably the, the idea of the surveillance capitalism, you know, this famous book which came out a couple of years ago, that is, you know, in, in the freest country in the world, namely the United States, our data has become a commodity. We have become a commodity which is tradable and, you know, uh, <laughs> you know sold in various cyber spaces. And I think that is also leading to a certain um, uh, trend towards localization of data. Uh, the debates about you know digital sovereignty, for instance, um, a lot of that is happening in uh, you know not just in authoritarian one-party states. For example, in India, there is a big debate currently going on about data sovereignty, um, and they are spending a lot of money in setting up data centers. Uh, they don't want their data to be in China or in Europe or wherever. Um, how do you see this phenomena in terms of the, the kind of commodification of information, not just news media, and this contestation between two models, the dominant model? And as like Vincent said, there is also a European version, which is more regulated, public-oriented, etc. Um, but the dominant one, if you look at the who are the top platforms in the world, you have to look very hard to find a European platform. Right? They're essentially all American. And they're also now, you know, distributors for news. So if you don't have access to global, Google or Facebook or, you know, other platforms, you don't know what is trending if you don't have. So it's not just, so BBC cannot survive on its own without having presence in social media. And for a generation that you were referring earlier, who thinks that news is free, they didn't want to watch television or read a newspaper. It's what they get on their phone. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely. I, I um, no, I, I, I should have mentioned that earlier. I mean, this, this whole sort of um, American emphasis where it's it's all just a kind of commercial good and we ourselves and our attention has become a, a commercially traded um uh entity is is absolutely worrying and 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 that's that's why there was this sort of pushback certainly in europe in order to regulate that and make sure that you can't just have your your data traded and used and stolen without 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 your permission but americans don't often don't understand that i mean they think the sort of regulations in europe is all just uh you know it, it is is a ridiculous waste of time that it's all about the sort of free market free market trading so that that i think that what that was a response definitely a response to uh, to, to the, the the whole sort of um, surveillance capital narrative which i think has been very very um sober and a good a good warning warning to us all um that just sort of letting yourself be um be sort of you used uh, in the interest of a sort of global um advertising phenomenon is 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 uh you know it's very worrying so yeah you know you're absolutely you're you know you're you're yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm not sure what what question you're what the question is really because I I think um I think it's very obvious that that we have these these sort of different tendencies pulling in 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 different areas and uh, the model in in developing countries is sometimes looking at China and thinking well you know we want that kind of control we don't want this sort of free free for all either a commercial free for all or a political free for all that 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 you get in you know in a country where the, the you know obviously it's all about the first amendment and and you know capitalism being able to do as it as it as it wishes so so the question really was about whether this trend demonstrates a, a bigger shift which is which is the deglobalization of communication of trade of you know all this part of this 
tech war which is happening, decoupling, whatever you want to call it. But it, it seems to be also reflected in narratives. For instance, if you look at, uh, we mentioned Ukraine earlier, uh, this is a very different debate about that in China, for instance, or India, for instance, which is not for their own reasons. Or, or in Turkey, or in Iran, or in even Brazil. So, th so that's what I'm saying. And that debate is not happening so much in the in the mainstream media. It's like a lot of it is happening in social media. So these platforms become very important. You know, the the algorithms become very important, and, hmm. and therefore it's sort of, you know, if if algorithms are controlled by a company in China, then they might promote their own version of events, and then they go. So that that's the kind of concern and worry. <laughs> But, yeah, yeah. Yes, I, th I think that um, uh, the, this sort of huge American dominance meant that there was one particular mode and that has that is now being challenged. But it it's as you said, the most of the platforms are still very much Silicon Valley based based in based in the in the US. So we haven't really seen um, I mean, other than China and and, and the, the way that the, the Chinese Internet is run. Um, we are still, you know, you can go to the middle Afri of Africa and everybody still, you know, got wants to be on Facebook or, or, yeah. or so on. So I think, uh, um, I, I think telling different narratives and different local political narratives is is one thing. But I think the sort of tech infrastructure is still very much dominated by by America, particularly America, not and not certainly not European platforms. All right. Last question, Vincent. Well, what would well, how should we imagine or ambition um, global media organization will look like? How will they change? When we are all talking about this decoupling, this deglobalization, right? So it's not everybody is moving to the same direction now. Like we are swimming against the current. So there's a deglobalization trend, but we still want to maintain some sort of global media because we still need to have trusted source of news. And then everybody is saying that we should fact check everything, which is worrying because it means that everything can be fake, right? That's why we have to check everything. And I think one of the major missions of the BBC World Services is also like, how can we work with fact checking organization or, or to improve um, people's awareness, media literacy of, of that sort. So how should we think in terms of management, in terms of not only media management, but as a global trend, what would global media look like in the current wave of deglobalization? Just very vaguely, of course, say five to My 10. My goodness, <laughs> <laughs> that is a huge, huge. It's the last question. The last question the is last open, <laughs> it's open and you can think about anything, yeah. Professor. Yeah. Well. Well, that, that that would be too dangerous to speculate about what, <laughs> what, what the world would look. But but I do I go back to these the the trends we've been talking about. I mean, this sort of you know increasing fragmentation where we want to listen to our own communities and globalization. Um, I think what you've just hinted at the rise of the fact checker is extraordinary. I mean, I have a colleague who writes about who writes about this and researches it, and it is it is a remarkable. You know the, the idea that you would need to fact check every image that comes out and the, and the way that things are, uh, are but but I mean, I mean I'm sure you see many of these um, uh, deep fake videos you know going back to the one of Nancy Pelosi drunk and that kind of thing and when yeah. you can do that kind of thing yeah. on on the, on the media then you do need to fact check absolutely absolutely everything which is uh, you know is, is 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 an extraordinary would would have seemed extraordinary to us many years ago but I think that's the kind of media literacy that we need we need to be teaching now and i think you teaching media literacy and making sure that a rising generation and all generations and older people as well who don't understand that you can you can manipulate a video and and um make it say all, all sorts of um fake things we all need to be alert to that and to be alert to 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 how media is being used and how we are being manipulated whether it's our data being stolen um, or we're being fed false narratives, or we're being told that, you know, that this is all just, you know, news is just something that, that comes in the air for, for free, rather than something that has to be sort of worked at and, and explained and, and paid for. Um, I think, all, you know, it's, 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 it's up to all of us to, to understand how, how media works and how media, media platforms are, 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 are developing.
No, and that is our effort through this series to ensure other people have more information, more education about how the media works. And there's no gospel that comes out from one part of the planet and everybody has to necessarily follow to that. Thank you very much, Professor Susanna Franks. Thank you very much, Professor Kusu. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Soon to be Dr. Vincent, but Vincent for now. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here.